concrete examples of how the deficit model uh, can really have an effect on uh, student outcomes. And then understanding the importance of commitment and capacity in the education equation. So as we look specifically, and I hope you have it in front of you, if you don't, please, please find it in the next couple of minutes, your own improvement plan. Um, we will want to, we want you to think about this, this real issue of commitment and capacity uh, in solving these problems. Now, you all saw, hopefully, although, you know, there may be some shifts in terms of who attended this one versus the SMART program, but I think it's definitely worth a few minutes to review where we are in terms of who's on our lists. And this is specific to non-TRAD. Um, <clears throat> for some of you, you can see at the beginning there, there are a certain number of schools, looks like at about 12 or 13, we have never been on this list. And you're probably going, what happened? But I also have people that just seem to stick to this list like, like flypaper uh, and everything in between. So we have to be careful about the assumptions we make. And so I always want to pause people and say, look, look, let's slow down our thinking because it's really easy to jump to certain assumptions. Oh, we're a rural school or we're, a, you know, um, um, uh, have a very different population or our parents or something. And some of that is true, but some of it is not. And, and we now have enough schools that have come off the list that we can often find and, uh, and have your school talk to another school that's very similar in demographics and, and size. Um, to share what changes they made to, to get off this list. And that's, that's good news. We want all hands on deck because, you know, you've got a lot to do. Simply worrying about an indicator is not your, your primary goal. And we understand that. An indicator is simply that, an indicator. It is intended to simply give you an idea of what's happening, but your analysis of that indicator is what we really care about. And we want to help with that. We also see this then when we look at community colleges and I get on the SMART call, the SMART, smart goal um, presentation that we did, I was not, um, I did not bring in a community college to speak. Um, however, I, I, it is my hope today that we will be speaking with the community college and talking about some of the excellent things that they've done and oops, they fell back on the list this year. We'll talk about why, what happened and what they're continuing to do for improvement. Um, so I'm really, I'm pleased about um, that participation. So just to remember again, uh, from 19 to 21, we were really moving in the right direction. I mean, we've got the blue is um, the number of schools that are on uh, the list and it was declining, uh, not on the list is, is uh, growing. Uh, so 19 to 21 for secondary schools and more improves, it was statistically significant because we had enough numbers to be able to um, provide that data. Uh, for post-secondary, the sample size is much smaller, so it's more difficult, but nevertheless, you can see we are continuing to move in the right direction and good news. But then something happens and we call it COVID-19. I expect there are other issues, but let's just face it, it affected everything. And so we saw this huge increase um, and things just kind of blew up out of the water. But what's important to say here, this is for post-secondary, this is for secondary, is that while the indicator is of students who are underrepresented in non-traditional programs, that really is, is not what we're looking at. This, this is a much bigger issue. These, this data point isn't that suddenly underrepresented students all ran for the hills. This seems to be, from my perspective, an indicator that we are experiencing a, a strong effect of COVID-19 on our schools, both our ability to access students um, and also uh, because of cutoff tours and apprenticeship opportunities and everything else, but also because of the trauma that's felt in our communities and families. And so the first thing I wanna do, right, jumping in right at the beginning of this presentation is for us all just to take a deep breath, including me, and talk about how did or does the effect or impact of COVID-19 affect your school community? 
I've had people say, oh, we're going to bounce back. I think by now we know bouncing is a little harder in some things than others. And so the question is, and this is an open mic, or you can put something in the chat. What I would like to do is just really hear from you. So please tell us, how did COVID-19 affect you and your school community? Please just tell us your name and your school. And please take a moment, empower yourself to share. Let's hear what's going on in the world with our schools. And I've asked permission, and I, I believe I've been given permission to ask Johnson College, uh, my good friend Kellen, if she would mind, uh, Dr. Williams, if you would, uh, if you have a few opening thoughts. So um, COVID-19 affected Johnson College, specifically in our non-track um, participation. For four years, we saw positive growth. We had females in all of our trade and um, transportation areas and then COVID happened and we saw a drastic decline in our students and our health occupations, our male students in our health occupations. And I think we alluded that a little bit last year when we were on these calls um, showing our data and our efforts to um, meet non-trad indicator numbers. But um, to give you an example, fall 20, we had 25 females in non-trad occupations and we had 18 males. And then the following year, we dropped to four males in non-trad. And we actually increased females to 32. So a lot of our focuses were on the females, but now we're transitioning post-COVID to focus on males and health occupations. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind, if you could also just sort of share, how did COVID overall affect your school? Did you find enrollment was affected? Uh, did you have more personal challenges with faculty or students? I mean, what 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 was going on and as you moved off campus to on campus? And tell us, tell, what was going on? Tell us your experience. Sure. So our industry partners were um, pretty open. They allowed us to use their industry space so that we could spread our labs out um, so we didn't have to stop instruction. Our students did push back. They didn't like the online learning. Now they seem to be more open with online learning post uh, COVID, but it's still um, they prefer the face to face interaction with their, their faculty members. Um, I mean, our, our faculty they were pretty, pretty good with um, the transition from on campus to the virtual world with simulation softwares and um, online classrooms. The students were somewhat receptive of it. Now they want to go back to on campus. And uh, our industry was really open to us going to their, their sites and using their training facilities to help our students achieve their, their educational goals and credentialing. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll bug you again in a few minutes, but um, I would love to hear from some other folks. I got in trouble once for calling names out, but I see a lot of um, um, turned off video and I would appreciate it if you wouldn't mind. I mean, it's like having your students look at you. Um, it's a very, it's a very uh, supportive, um, experience, you want your students to see their face. Oh, what happened? Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. Can someone share with us about their secondary education experience? I'll, I'll bring something up. Okay. Tunk can at Greg Ellsworth. Um, when we hit, are you guys hearing me? I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay. When, when we hit COVID, I would say at least 50% of our entire student body moved to our cyber school. 
Um, we have five approved programs and probably eight supplemental programs that are, are much smaller in scope, but, but some of them do meet guidelines. Um, because not only did a lot of our kids go to, to cyber school, we also decreased the number of days we were in school. We went to a hybrid model. So kids were only in school two days per week with one day where everybody was on cyber um, in a Canvas type model. So the reason we had the hybrid was specifically for the CTE classes so that the kids would be able to come in and, and get at least some of their hands-on learning. But I mean, as everybody would know, uh, it's difficult to teach welding online. It's difficult, you know, you don't feel the heat, you don't feel the sparks, you don't, you don't, the safety aspects become a real, a real burden. Um, we also have a very high demographic of free and reduced lunch. Um, a lot of students were, went to work. Um, and a lot of those ones that went to work were students that were in our, our shops. Our shop numbers dropped by nearly 60, 65%. So we took a, we took a heck of a hit. Um, on just on specifically in my programs in the CTE area. Um, it did jump back up the following year, but people were still real skittish. Um, students, you know, we were still out a lot. Um, school got shut down several times by the state. Um, so they just weren't, you know, students were, were pushing, they got behind. Um, number one, they fell behind in their regular classes. They were failing some of them. So some of the kids couldn't come back to CTE anyway because they were, they were making up they were making up their algebra. They were making up their English that they didn't put a lot of time into. Um, and kids were working 30 some hours a week, you know, <laughs> and they shouldn't have been. Um, so, but this past year, our numbers jumped up big time. Um, I have 80 some kids in my welding program. Um, we That's the most we've ever had. I mean, we, we used to have like 35, 40 kids at the most. We more than doubled our numbers. So, um, and we have quite a few non-trads compared to what we used to have in our welding. Um, although that's not one of our approved programs because we, we, there's a competition clause with us and, and the SCCTC, not that, not that there's anything wrong with that, but we, uh, that's, that's kind of our story. I mean, a lot of our kids just went out um, and I, when kids can't come in and the whole idea, a lot of these kids wanna have the hands-on opportunities and they just weren't awarded to them because of being out of the school. So, um, that in conjunction with a lot of kids, we had kids that left and never returned, um, that went into the workforce, um, from our programs. I still run into them and they're making great money. They're doing great things with some of the training that they did get here. Um, but it's a shame. They, they lost out on not only additional training, but they lost out on a graduate on graduating and getting a, a diploma. So it, it hit, I mean, I'm not sure if everybody got hit the same as we did, but we got hit hard, um, yeah. especially in our CTE areas. Thank you so much for sharing that because, you know, I can say it all day long, but this is exactly the kinds of stories I was hearing. Yep. Um, and anyone else want to, you know, share or um, add to that or have a Yeah, Claudia, I'll jump in. Thank I'll you. Jump in. Um, yeah, Nick Gassis, School District of Philadelphia. Um, yeah, so our, you know, obviously everyone was closed for a half of 1920. But in our district, we were we were uh, virtual the whole entire uh, 2021 school year. So last year we came back in person. Um, last year's 12th grade students missed a year and a half, upwards of a year and a half of um, of hands-on instruction. So that that impacted us greatly, impacted the, the students greatly. Um, yeah, it impacted NOCTI industry certifications. Um, but even the, the year 2021, when we were 100% virtual, um, let's be honest, the virtual setting wasn't for everyone, and it, and it greatly impacted attendance. Attendance was, was very poor in the virtual setting. Um, there were, I've heard stories from schools where uh, students would be on their phone during a, a Zoom class while they were at a job working, you know, um, so you know, there were a lot of, lot, of, lot of instances like that, like that that took place, you know, over the course of, um, of COVID. Um, and then I, I noticed, we've noticed in 21, 22 last year when students were back, um, of course, they haven't had the, the year and a half of hands-on instruction. Um, 
but they are industry certification numbers did jump up greatly, you know, from the previous year, because as somebody previously said, you, you, you really, um, it's tough to prepare for the Naki if you don't, if you don't have hands-on skills, the same, same for certification. You can't sit for a lot of these certifications at home. You have to be in an in-person setting. So that's why our industry certification numbers were, you know, were, uh, pretty poor in 2021, but they definitely jumped up in 21, 22. So. Thank you. Tell me about um, your faculty. What happened with the faculty? Yeah, so um, we've had a lot. We had a lot of retirement. Lots, lots of retirement, um, and just chasing our tails, trying to trying to fill positions. So yeah, that 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 was, you know, that that was an issue. Um, at the end of, yeah, really at the end of 1920. People that weren't planning on retiring decided that was it for them. You know, they, they, even if they had a few years left, they, they planned on staying another three to five years. At the end of 1920, they were they were done. And then we had um, a really uh, significant exodus at the end of um, at the end of 21. Slowed down at the end of 22, so we ha haven't had that many as many retirements. But yeah, it definitely impacted our faculty in that regard. Thank you. And I, and I heard it, I've heard anecdotally by visiting schools and talking to the counselors that the trauma that was experienced by students and faculty remains. That uh, the social development of the students, um, they're not just their academic, but their emotional development it was affected, that they are uh, struggling to, um, you know, get back into the formal structure of classrooms and settings because, you know, they've had a lot of freedom. Um, and it's just, it's just been, you know, it's, it's not just opening the doors and returning to normal, right? So thank you very much. Does anybody want to um, add some additional thoughts that, that we haven't touched on that, that really we need to? And I'll, I'll, gonna, I like to pause because, you know, sometimes it takes a minute to feel comfortable forming our thoughts. I think I'm just going to add something, if that's okay. Please. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the faculty and about that side. It has been very difficult for our faculty and it still remains very difficult. I think people think that we are back to normal here in our schools and we are not. Um, even getting instructors in here and keeping instructors um, you know, we still have the last wave, if you would like to call that, of COVID students, you know, that entitlement that is still out there. Um, we are very happy to see that the new students that we got, um, you know, there's more structure, there's more, I want to be here, I want to learn. Um, but I think, um, you know, with the, the demands of everything, you know, the teachers' lessons and their students being out, the mental um, health right now of our instructors and our students is really taking a burden on the staff. And, um, and that, that goes from our admin assistants to the faculty, you know, to everyone here who helps all of our students. So I think that people thinking, you know, and, and I understand that there's deadlines and I understand reports have to be in and I, under, I understand that. But at the same time, um, we aren't back to normal and, um, and it's, it still has a, a great toll. Yeah, thank you so much. And it, it, make sure that I pronounce your name correctly. Is it Andra or Andra or Dr. Grohler or? Um, it's Andra. Andra, thank you. Thank you thank all you. For, for your participation in that, that brief conversation because um, it, this really goes to the point that, that I wanna make during this presentation. And that is that, you know, we look back on the greatest generation, right? We talk about World War II and how everybody pulled together. And, you know, we can, we can do that partly because we, most of us weren't alive during that time, but that we can look at all the things that people did during that time, 
um, to support a goal. And, you know, we haven't even had a minute yet to stand back as future generations will do and look at this pandemic and think about all the things that we had to do to be able to get through this. <clears throat> Some of us didn't. I mean, you know, we lost over a million people. Uh, and I think that it's really important, particularly for current technical education, because unlike uh, the more traditional formats of education, CTE has an additional list of requirements through Perkins. It has the requirement of the hands-on, which you know is a wonderful, wonderful thing to, to be able, it's one, one of the things we'd like to see more uh, in traditional education because hands-on is the best way to learn. And, uh, and yet when you can't put your hands on anything, it makes it incredibly difficult. So trying to figure that out has been huge. Um, and it affects every part of our life. I have on my wall, I often tell people this, I have on my wall, and this is my personal feeling about it, that the, um, the greatest thing a father can do for his children is love their mother. And I repeat that often, not because I want everybody to go home with it, but really to, to realize that it has a larger symbol, which is that we have to figure out not just how we love our students, our children, if you will, but we have to learn about how to love each other, right? So sometimes what's also created is the environment of incredible stress among our faculty and our staff. People lost their jobs, people walked away, people had to carry extra loads, and we all have to take a moment to just be continue to be gentle with our staff and each other and I, as I always say, seek to understand, not to judge, because we're still there. We are, this is still a, a, a movement. It's a movement back in the right direction, but it has been really challenging. And believe me, 100 years from now, people will still be talking about this period of time. And you, you survived it, and you're still here, and you're still doing the work. And so congratulations. Um, but with that in mind, let's not put that aside. Let's instead use that as an example of what I talk about in creating an equitable learning environment and the education equation. So, because so often we look at teacher content knowledge, teacher pedagogical knowledge, you know, how they disseminated, how, what are the assessments, the assessments being the indicators we get. And that we used to historically think that's all that goes into it. But as we know, in a greater way than ever before, there are outside variables that we don't want to just think about as a bunch of small strategies. We really need to think about this as part of the education equation. This is not just something else that gets thrown in the mix. This is a very large part. And to the extent we don't pay attention to it, we cannot attract all the students that could benefit from CTE education, including those who may be underrepresented. So when I talk about an equitable learning environment, right, we have to think about how we equip educators to address all these things in their classroom, right? So generally there's this rush, and I talked about this on the SMART goals presentation, to sort of Oh, I know what this is. I have it, but it's like just pause through this presentation because it's, as you can see with our discussion about COVID, it's so much more complex. It's not just about it's. It is absolutely about the transition to online, but it's also about some of these students had to get work and help support their families because their families lost their job. Somebody died in their family, or you know they didn't have enough food in their. I mean, it's so much. It's so much more complicated, and so it requires a pause and a think a little bit deeper. Um, and historically, as we think about school attributes, the climate, the resources that we need, we also have to pay attention to the family, the home and the community culture. And I wanna talk a little bit further on about this term culture, which often gets confused um, with, with other terms. Culture can be anything. In Pennsylvania, you know, you have a culture of the Amish, you have a culture of, you know, Philadelphia, you have a culture of Sus Susquehanna or Beaver counties. Um, you know, th these are all different cultures. And so, excuse me for drinking water here in the middle of it. We have to think about all that. But we also recognize 
and then every individual brings with them the academic, social, emotional, and physical elements that make them unique. So all those things together go into that missing variable and that equitable learning environment. Now, <coughs> feel free, and I know there's some, um, Aaron, you're monitoring the chat, I think. Um, if there are any questions, just let me know. Just yell out at me if you want to. Um, but don't yell at me, just yell at me if you don't mind. Um, building upon SMART goals. One of the things we talked about was what is the model for the SMART goals? And we're gonna talk a little bit about this. And then over the next few times we, we um, will meet, we'll dig in a little deeper. Knowing that this model comes not from research, it's supported by research. So it comes from practitioners. Everything in here should be very like applicable to you. It should be very applicable to your uh, uh, faculty, your staff, your teachers. We've learned it from the field, right? What I call the wisdom of the practice. Um, we started looking here if you remember, at the near process for improvement. And we're gonna to return to this piece a little bit today because um, uh, I wanna just dig a little bit deeper on that. Now, I gave you an example of the importance of care of your uh, teachers, of each other, of your, um, of your students. But the reality is that we've got so much going on that sometimes, and I'm gonna have to, I think I'm gonna have to stop share and go back and reshare. Hold on a second, because I don't think I checked my little boxes. Nope. I'm gonna show you, this is about a three to four minute video. And I want you to think about it in terms of, um, you might wanna take a couple notes or something, about two elements, commitment and capacity. Now, as much as this can be difficult to watch at the beginning, these are based on my own personal experiences, fortunately not from any one school, but at different schools for different reasons. And so the beginning of this, which is a little bit of a, it's a dream she's having, it talks about the different um, people in the room and some of the challenges they're facing. What, what is it? Is it commitment or capacity? And part of your challenge in, in implementing your improvement plan is to ask yourself, you know, given we were just coming out of COVID, how do we identify that we have the commitment and the capacity? So let's just take a few minutes and watch this and we'll come back on the other end, we'll ask some questions. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for the coffee. I need it. I had the strangest dream last night. Oh, yeah? Interesting. Tell me about it, Sharon. I dreamed... Good morning. I'm really glad to be joining you this morning. I am Angelo Pizone, the principal. I'm so glad to welcome you here. Unfortunately, I am extremely busy today, so I'm gonna have to leave. Uh, Vice Principal Jefferson is in charge, and as you know, he really runs the school, so you have the best leader here. You can fill me in later as needed. Okay, great. Call me Sean. I'm excited to tell you, we already have a lot of initiatives already in place to support equity in our school. Everyone gets along. We love our students, and it is a great school. That said, I'm happy to organize an hour-long professional development presentation so you can present to all our teachers about equity. We have an open PD time to fill. Oh dear. I see a problem with a few students popping up. I may need to take this. Our students are our priority, of course. I'll send you the date and time for the PD. I'm Susan Jasper, the school counselor. My colleague Cindy and I do all recruiting of students from sending schools. We offer school tours, visit and present at sending schools, host student events, and conduct all admissions, screening, and acceptance. It's a heavy load. And I have to tell you, our schedule is already overwhelming. We can't add anything else. I see. I'm Mr. Cornwallis. I've run a machining here for 15 years and it's very regulated by state and federal guidelines. So I can't change much, if anything. In addition, I have tried to recruit girls for years and they just don't want to enter the field. So I don't know why we keep being hassled about it. Shouldn't we let kids follow their own interests? 
Isn't this about normalizing machining and highlighting manufacturing opportunities? I just think we need better students. Skill, ability, interest. The teachers are doing everything they can. If students drop out, it's because we enroll the wrong students. Um, well... Hi, Miss Ortega. Uh, I'm taking notes. Uh, Principal Davis asked me to be here to help you. I have lunch menus. Oh, I have to get going uh, to ascending school to make a presentation. I'm so glad Ms. Ortega is here to take notes. I'll read them later. As the teacher union representative, I have to go to a teacher mediation. I have two teachers fighting with administration. We need to make sure our voices are heard. Well, I, I need to order lunch for everyone uh, to get it on time. The dream ended with me staring out the window at everyone running away. Wow, that's not a dream, that's a nightmare. <laughs> Let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us again for our weekly equity team meeting. You all know Sharon Hernandez, who represents our English language learning program. She'll be joining us from here on out to help us better understand the needs and the assets of our new families from Mexico and Colombia, and how we can work together to best support our international children. Glad that was just a dream. I'm really happy to join you all. We're delighted to have you join us and look forward to hearing your ideas. I also want to welcome Mr. Stevens, the lead teacher in culinary arts. Uh, Mr. Stevens is going to update us on his work on relevance in culinary arts, and I'm looking forward to hearing about his new community garden. I am working with 4-H to develop a plan for selecting fresh vegetables for the students to grow. There is a lot of interest in farm-to-table eating. Also, a local church is volunteering to help water and care for the plants if they can have extra produce for their low-income families. I want my students to connect cooking to health and community well-being. Great. I am also pleased to invite Jonas Smith, who is one of our culinary arts student ambassadors. He will be serving on this team as well. It's great to be here. I'm really excited about the community garden, but it has already hit a snag. We need more tools, shovels, and trowels. I'm on it. I can work with the students in my program together with the carpentry program to make the tools we need. Our new 3D printer can help with that too. I knew I picked the right school and the right career. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Ms. Ortega is going to share the data she analyzed from the annual student surveys we collected. Okay, um, hopefully you got from that, let me put this back into this mode, that we need to evaluate our commitment and capacity in our schools, given we've just come out of COVID. Sometimes right now, all we can do is really focus on the students we have and the challenges of just returning to normal. However, um, that also can be part of our improvement plans. So when you saw the data early on and the jump, uh, particularly among post-secondary education, it is also about asking yourself what came off the list did we not get to do tours? How many tours did we do? Were they all online instead of in person? Did we get to connect to students, uh, ambassadors who were able to go out? How do we bring these programs back, not just the way they were, but does this give us an opportunity to improve some of these elements? Do we change our language slightly in doing our tours or doing our shadowing such that we improve um, our results. Now, what we are beginning to hear anecdotally is that students are returning in record numbers to a number of the schools that CTE has suddenly blossomed, good news, and we're beginning to see some underrepresented students in some of these non-traditional programs, such, I know I was just um, talking to um, some folks in Chester County, their HVAC program has, I think, five females in a program that never had a female in it. So the question is, isn't how do we um, 
uh, you know, just get back to normal. But how do we, how do we in this moment look at our improvement plans and say, as we bring programs back online and, and help students, you know, readjust to, to this culture of, of the classroom, what are there, are there any windows of opportunity for strengthening? I want you to think about that. But the other thing that I've heard from folks is, I don't know why I got off the list and I don't know why I'm back on it. That is an ad hoc process. That means that it's, and it's not meant to be a criticism, but it's like we, the, the time required to analyze it is that we want you to be able to look at your data as, um, and I've asked Kellen to be here because she does a beautiful job, her team of integrating. And, and we talked about this on the smart plan, integrating the, uh, the, their work throughout their, um, all of their efforts so that it leads to continuous improvement. So you may occasionally, when there's a massive problem uh, like COVID, to bump back onto a list, but um, then you will immediately move on because you will look about at your metrics and sort of say, okay, what happened here and where do we need to focus, which is exactly what she's doing, which, I love you, Kellen, because you're great. You're a perfect example <laughs> of, of what we're trying to do here. So um, again, and many of you are doing this. I just happened to, to have spent some time working with, and I apologize, I, I, I love um, the folks I get a chance to work with, um, but I just, I just want to say, as we get to know each other, I know many of you are doing some terrific work. But over here, and this is the, the, the model when we talk about moving from um, this initial ad hoc perspective at the bottom level upwards, it's a complex process. It is not done overnight. So beginning to work collaboratively, getting technical assistance on your improvement plans is a great way to make sure you get off once and for all and if so for some reason there's a bump, you understand the bump and you understand how to, the process works to get you back off the indicator. Because again, the indicator is just a point in time, a mark. It really is about just checking in. We expect people to have you know, had some challenges with their indicators. You can't come through a storm without a little damage. So, you know, we recognize that, but, just also a remember, and, and looking at this, just so you know what you're looking at, um, we are looking at what's called the um, Software Engineer Institute's Capability Maturity Model. It's based out of Carnegie Mellon, and it was developed and adapted for uh, the STEM Equity Initiative. So, you know, at some point we can walk through each of these, but really what we want to talk about, and I'm going to just, let's see. Um, I'm going to go back to you so that you see over here on the bottom left hand level is engagement level and school based leadership and team engagement level on the left hand bottom side disengaged developing progressing pervasive and what we're talking about when we talk about the school based leadership and team is that whole idea of we need commitment to perform right and capacity to perform. So sometimes when we go into schools, we'll find a little team that's sort of put off to the side. And when we talked about the SMART goals and the relevancy, there should not, you should not need necessarily, I mean, you might need sort of a idea generator equity team, but really that leadership should be built in throughout all of what you're doing. You don't do the, all the, you know, uh, traditional, um, um, uh, curriculum development, uh, pedagogy, and assessments, and oh, by the way, you've got this equity piece you have to go do. It, it needs to blend in, and understanding that it, as you blend it all together, um, it becomes part of your commitment to checking on your kids, right? So we have, you know, um, uh, represent, great representation in this particular program, our um, IT program. Uh, do we have any uh, students in there who, you know, are non-English speaking or do we have any, you know, Hispanic students or do we have any, um, 
um, you know, other special needs or special population students. It's, it's the second question that allows you to disaggregate and look at who's in the room. This program is completely full. That's fantastic. Now, let's just make sure we also had a diversity in that classroom. And it's not because just filling a room is enough. It's about making sure that we're really, that we're really getting the full opportunities of access to, um, to all the students. If you have an unenrolled program, part of it is sort of asking yourself the question, are we really focused on this particular program? When we talk about building improvement plans, we're really talking about, sometimes it can be just, we're just gonna focus on our um, agriculture program because it's under-enrolled and it, and it you know, doesn't have a lot of diversity in it. So, you know, how do we represent, you know, how do we get more students in there? Our medical programs, um, you know, our enrollments, as Kellen was saying, our enrollments drop significantly, but now they're coming back up. But are we making sure that we're reaching every population we can? Because if, as I always say about my kids, if I have three kids, I always have to check one, two, three, because at any given time, one of them roams off and, uh, and we don't want that to happen. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a second pause point and we're gonna put you into small groups and we're gonna, Cindy and I are gonna just be, be around for help or support as you need. But we'd like you to talk to each other and you don't have to, it doesn't have to be about your current school, it could be about a previous school, it could be whatever, but how committed do you feel your school and leadership are to increasing underrepresented students in non-traditional programs of study? And as, as in addition to all students, right? So we're not saying only, but you know, how does it integrate into your larger goal? And then secondly, how much capacity do you have to think about and work towards improving your non-traditional outcomes? And uh, please explain why with specific examples. So we're gonna give you uh, about 10 minutes um, to just work on this. And uh, I think you have the question. So I would love to hear um, from the groups. Um, I'm just gonna push my PowerPoint back to where it, we're doing a report out. And anybody wanna, you can either open your mic and just share or um, type something in the chat box and Aaron will let us know. Please, please tell us what you heard. I can go quickly for the, the institution of higher education. A lot of us said that we're adding it to our um, strategic plans, um, the diversity, inclusion, equity conversation. Okay, great. Okay. Other other groups? Uh, there is a comment from one of the groups, um, commitment issues, lacking board support, stuck in a traditional purely academic mindset that is also outdated, budget cuts, especially in rural areas and losing students, thus losing programs. Okay. I will just, go ahead. No, I was just going to say another comment. We are at a critical mass in hiring, retaining adjunct faculty due to budgetary concerns. Okay. Well, I'm going to just say that I really enjoyed uh, the group that I was in because the challenges they're facing really seem to be they've got an over enrollment or an enrollment at peak and thinking about how to integrate this. Um, their, their focus on underrepresented students and non-traditional programs, along with all the other elements within their whole improvement plan. So uh, moving away from this traditional uh, two-point focus, which is everything else, and then focusing on underrepresented students and non-trad programs, to thinking about all that we're doing, we're returning and, re for instance, returning from COVID, uh, at what's changed, what are the opportunities, um, you know, as tours start up again, how do we do that? And then, you know, how do we move to completion? Because if you are at full enrollment, you still have the issue now because of Perkins changes of completion. And so we, we need to build that into our uh, strategies, but in a way that um, 
works for all students, including those uh, where you have those uh, underrepresented students. I'm, I'm hearing great news about some of these programs in rural and urban areas where they have surprisingly high numbers of students in, who are underrepresented. How do we message out? Um, and then the other thing I heard, which I just love hearing, is that we've been working with these groups since elementary school, and now, you know, the, we're reaping the benefit, which is terrific news, um, because that's, that's right. Um, you can get kids excited about these programs um, early, early on, and then, you know, keep talking to them, they'll show up. It's no, no magic there, it's just a lot of hard work. So, um, we, we're talking now, we're gonna just shift a little bit, right? So we've talked about how we have to make sure we have our commitment and capacity. You know, if we're gonna assign people to these tasks or to pay attention to these things or to collect data or uh, to take in more students or all that, we, those are all capacity issues. And um, you can have the greatest commitment and I've worked with schools before, believe me, they are so committed it almost makes me want to cry because they're just pulled in so many different directions. Staffing is a huge issue. They're short, um, and that's that's real. So it's always got to be. You can't you know you got to do some prep work in terms of making sure your faculty are trained and your you know and not just when you're tr providing professional development to new faculty, you're going to want to introduce um, all of the elements about how we want to focus on underrepresented students too. But let's talk about what that means, okay? So um, I'm gonna focus now a little bit on the asset approach. And <laughs> here's the challenge, particularly if you work in Perkins, right? So just bear with me, what now? We have within this, this our framework for Perkins, uh, focus on individuals, our special pops, right? Individuals with economically disadvantaged families, including low-income youth and adults, Individuals preparing for non-traditional fields, single parents, including single, pre single pregnant women, out of workforce individuals, homeless individuals, youth who are in or aged out of foster care, youth with a parent who is a member of the armed forces, is on active duty, individuals with other barriers to educational achievement, including individuals with limited English proficiency. You also, as the general uh, goal, have to focus on race, ethnicity, LGBTQ, bullies or bullied children, children of the incarcerated, et cetera. Somehow we're asking our faculty who are also supposed to be experts in their content area to address any issue that arises today and still be vigilant about teaching their content using the best pedagogy possible. So where do we begin? Well, with our model, <laughs> what we say is just pause on all those and let's just help our faculty to create what's called an equitable learning environment. Now that's, you know, that's just a term, equitable learning environment. You could call it a loving learning environment or a welcoming learning environment. It's just a learning environment where knowing everything there is to know about every different kind of child and the intersections they're in, right? Like who is not included in that list? The truth is, is that what we know, and I refer to Brene Brown here, for those of you who are new to my work, I, I, I look at her a lot as really the, one of the experts on this whole issue of empathy, not sympathy. What we're talking about, and this is, this is a gift because teachers generally go into education because they are empathetic. So good news, right? They like their content area, but they choose, instead of making more money in industry, they choose to teach. And um, it's because they care about their students. And um, they know because of COVID, because of lots of things that, are all that were already going on, that um, you know, they have to take care of their psychological needs. And boy, after COVID, there's a lot. And you talk to the counselors, they are overwhelmed. Um, their safety needs. And that's a particular concern when you're dealing with CTE. Uh, belongingness and love needs. If you remember your Eric Erickson, this is the sweet spot for teenagers and, and people in their 20s. They're all looking for those intimate relationships and it drives a lot of their decisions. In fact, even their career decisions. Um, esteem needs. They want to feel like they're doing well. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this in a moment when we talk about boys in particular, because um, we've gotten off the rails a little bit. Um, 
So we have to meet their basic needs. Step one, we have to meet their psychological needs. And when you close the door or you close this, and that could be the school doors or the you know classroom doors, and you create an environment where people's needs are met, that's when learning really takes place. And a love of learning takes place. They want to be with their peers who are kind and supportive. They want to be with their teacher who's interested and cares about them, no matter what. It's a safe space, almost a sanctuary, if you will. And we see that, and I talk about it all the time. When I interviewed, it was the top 108 teachers. I talked to them, I looked at their work, and found out they were identified from across the nation in 2013 that the students, that, that what they all had in common was not a strategy, it's that they loved their students and their students loved them. They created an environment, an equitable learning environment. And this is really based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs and we could talk about it all day long, but um, the, the issue is this, right now what we're working with, what you are all working with is trying to figure out how to add the missing variable, right? How do you, which strategy we do, a fixed versus growth mindset, racial justice, social emotional learning, working with trauma, poverty reduction, building trust, anti-bias training, character development, service learning, stereotype content model, social cognitive career theory, resilience training, brain-based response theory, mindset, stereotype threat, cultural competency, engineering design. And the most recent one I've been reading about is aspiration gap. Holy cow, how do you expect you got a hundred different challenges you're supposed to address as a teacher and, and equally an equal number of different theoretical frameworks. How do you do all of that? Well, for this particular presentation, what I wanna tell you is by creating this lovely um, framework, right? We are saying, okay, pause, be empathetic in the classroom. If there is a particular area, for instance, poverty reduction is a huge poverty is a really big issue in your community. That might be the first thing we do training or professional development for our teachers. But as you begin to think about that, maybe what we need to think about is um, these four buckets, because what we've done, what I've done is I, over the last 20 years or so, is figured out if I took all these different theories and practices and I compartmentalized them into a bucket, rather than one big bucket with a thousand strategies, I said, generally speaking, they all fall into one of four buckets. Normalize, empower, inclusive and relevant. And by that, what I mean for normalizing or normalize, it's an educational experience that connects to students, connects students to previously lived experiences and feel relatable and comfortable to students. Now, what this means is if you're taking a student who grew up in Columbia and that student's uh, coming into your classroom, um, their educational experience, their whole historical experience is going to be different than the American um, traditional classroom. So how do we create um, an experience where it feels normal or normalized? Now, think about this in another way. If you take your small baby home from the hospital and you put them in the crib and over the crib is this big pendant that talks about the college, Penn State, that you went to, you know, how likely is it that child is gonna go to college? Well, if you're already talking about Penn State and the football team and you give them a little t-shirt that says, I love Penn State, chances are they're gonna go to a college, if, if not Penn State, some, some other, that because college is normalized to them. The idea of going to college is normalized to them. So, you know, do we normalize community colleges? Do we normalize, you know, there's so many things, but you've got to start. That's why I love hearing about people going out to middle schools and elementary schools. You have to begin introducing the idea of CTE careers earlier to students. Um, and that's what that's kind of about. Now, a second one is empowering. And that bucket is very, is not well understood because empowering refers or empower refers to 
uh, the process of getting students to advocate for themselves. I have here, students are assets in the classroom, right? We don't see our students anymore as uh, just a series of deficits or problems we have to overcome. We also have to see their assets. They are responsible for and recognized for their own learning. We're not lowering the bar, we're believing in their ability to achieve it and get over it. And we believe that they are also responsible for the learning of others in their classroom. So they are part of the solution in that classroom. Students become increasingly resilient and confident in achieving academic and personal goals. This is a very difficult um, concept and many times not well understood. It's one of these um, uh, kind of uh, heuristic rules. People go, oh, empowering. But in fact, and I wanna talk about at some point in the future, a little bit about the aspiration gap that specifically refers to a greater focus on boys. Because what we're seeing now is a lot of young men are really struggling and boys um, because ambition doesn't just happen. It has to be fired from within. The culture is still searching for many mo models of masculine ideal, you know, medical um, programs that we want to encourage males in. We have to figure out ways to uh, better normalize these uh, professions for males. And right now, one fifth of all boys are, develop, develop, are, are labeled as developmentally disabled. And that does not in, instill in them a sense of confidence or competence. So when we talk about empowering, we do have to disaggregate our data a little bit because when you focus on one group and we have focused to a large extent on, on other groups, such as females, we do see the effect. Um, but we always have to go back to those three little children in the line that I talk about my children and see if somebody's wandering off. And right now, some of our boys are wandering off. How do we empower them to better aspire to their uh, highest potential, to their many opportunities? Inclusive, most of us understand this idea of inclusion. Uh, just because it's been in the media a lot, educators are aware of and responsive to the ways that students are marginalized by our current education system and educators' implicit bias. Now, that exists. I, I think that's right. Um, however, when we're talking about these three, four buckets, I would offer to you that one of the things that we want to do is really look at these buckets because I have visited a number of schools and found when I walked in that inclusion was not their biggest challenge. In fact, it wasn't a challenge at all. Students walked into their buildings and loved their programs. They loved coming to their CTE programs or the CTCs much more than the sending schools. Um, they've built a really strong community among the other students. And so, you know, we have to, when we do our improvement plans, really ask ourselves, where is the problem? If it is a problem of, of a bias, if, if it's toxic, the faculty are all fighting, this might be an area we really first need to focus on. But if that's not the issue, then we need to look at these other conditions. Relevant has two meanings here. The first, of course, from your SMART programs, which is we really need to think about how we weave this into the larger strategies of our school but also making sure that our programs are relevant to the communities where they graduate, where they learn, and where their world is. Generation Z is very focused on these very important uh, elements of uh, global warming. They're very interested in conditions of gun violence or access to guns, uh, and safety. Um, you know, they, they, they've, got, they've got very passionate ideas about food deserts, about you know how to make their world better. And as we empower them, part of what I've seen, some great ideas is folks working with Habitat for Humanity, uh, with working with ideas for supporting uh, uh, nonprofits that, that serve the homeless or veterans, um, so that we make their, their lives relevant today. We're not waiting for them to graduate. So one of the things I heard was, how do we get students to completion? The challenge is that, that they're going to work. They're feeling relevant in that experience. Money is very important, but helping them to see how 
in their programs now, they are serving the world. Even like cosmetology. If you're cutting somebody's hair, is it a child that without a haircut would be teased? Is it a person who's getting their first job and they need a haircut? Or is it somebody else who just can't afford um, just to, to look a little better with a little, you know, a nice haircut or something? What are we doing to make people's lives better today? And so that's gonna be an important component for helping students to become completers. Um, Okay, so we have one more small group. I see we have about 10 minutes on the clock. So um, we're just gonna take about five minutes and uh, jump back in to discuss uh, your current, anything you wanna talk about in terms of your improvement plans, um, how does it connect to your current challenges and um, anything you wanna just talk about in terms of your current plan and how you might think about it a little differently as we think about um, our underrepresented students. Okay? Okay. So any additional thoughts from that that anybody would like to share? Now, I will just add in that um, what I heard and I, I hear you know multiple times and so I want to really emphasize it is, is our participants here are really at different places. Some are new and are still learning um, and feel free to email me uh, Perkins questions that maybe you've been told three times and you still don't understand or whatever and I'm happy to help. Um, Cindy I'm sure would be happy to help. Um, we we want to make sure that you're fully aware of the requirements and you, you work in it so much sometimes you kind of get a sense of what it is and you think everybody else understands too and they don't and they're learning um, and so we want to be helpful to that and um, and some people have been here for a while um, and so I would encourage you to uh, reach out to folks who've been doing this for a while or uh, across schools and communities there's lots of opportunities anybody else um, I'm gonna reach out to my good friend, Kellen, and see if she, you have any final thoughts or input that you'd like to share. No, I think we each had a different approach in the institution of higher education based off of where our institutions are located and our focuses. Yeah, and that really goes to the point, which is that we have multiple strategies. And if we think there is a best practice, we will all miss it. But so we have to look at our own institutions. We have to look at our own classrooms. We are the implementers. We are the secret sauce. You, you are the secret sauce. You are the implementers. You are the 10 steps. So we're moving away from this idea of a best practice to talking about a best practitioner. And you, my friends, are the best practitioners. So what's next steps? We hope you will continue to participate. Um, the next oh, webinar, sorry. sorry again? They must participate. Remember, these are mandatory sessions. <laughs> okay. okay, yeah. Be sure you're logged on, but I will reiterate the word participate. The group two I was in, we had great participation from everybody, and I hope the other groups did too. So thank you very much for participating during this mandatory training. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and we're going to keep digging deeper with those near indicators to get you very specific information. Um, there is in the chat box, um, I believe, Erin, when you get a second, a link to a uh, questionnaire. Uh, please respond to it. And if there's a particular topic you either want more information about or um, more direction, we'll make sure that it gets built into the next one. And here's my email, um, cmorell at stemequityinitiative.com. Um, you know what? I always forget equity in me. There should be an I here. <laughs> I don't know why I do that. It's your website. <laughs> it's my website. So anyway, spell it correctly. Do what I say, not what I do. And uh, yeah, complete the survey in the chat. And thank you for attending. And I think we're at 1130. So, you know, always good to end on time. I hope everybody has a beautiful day and the weather gets nicer. So. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Have a great rest of the week. Claudia, I have a quick.